the regional winner from the Northland District. Member of the senior debating team, reserve for the Northland debating team, student director of Stage Challenge, the chair of the Arts Council, co-curator of the Whangarei, sorry, Whangarei Boys High School Arts Exhibition, and he says he also has a master's in procrastination. <laughs> From the Whangarei Boys High School, welcome Michael McCabe. Thank you. On the shores of Gallipoli, in the fields of Flanders, and in the deserts of northern Africa, it is here in which valiant New Zealanders protected the world and founded our national identity. Over very terrain, they withstood the wind, sleet, and searing heat and pushed on with new resolve. Until this day, brave New Zealand men and women emulate their tenacity on our modern battlefields. New Zealand pre-World War I was a nation just founded, a nation that still needed the nurturing arms of Great Britain for support, a nation still grappling with what it meant to belong to our own isles. However, over the following wars, we would prove to the world, but more importantly, ourselves, what it means to belong to New Zealand. This began at Gallipoli a place of treacherous ridges and spurs, where many young and eager New Zealanders arrived, only to be showered in bullets. This war was no longer a game. Only 30% who arrived on the fateful day of April the 25th, 1915, carried on. Yet they did not despair, and resolutely responded by digging into the foothills, clinging on to hope. One of these men was Cyril Bassett, VC, an honourable and humble man who played an integral part in our assault on Chanak Bear. He valiantly repaired the communications to the front line under the continuous onslaught of enemy fire. He did this out of his duty to both king and to country. Yet he humbly replied, it was just that I was so short the bullets would pass over me. Typifying the down-to-earth nature New Zealanders are so well known for. Yet, many never saw the sun rise again. We owe the nigh-on 3,000 at Gallipoli. The 13,000 who perished on the Western Front, not just for their brave deeds, not just for their self-sacrifice, but for their pioneering spirit, for they were the building blocks and the architects of the land of the long white cloud. Yet the war to end all wars did not. And after 20 years, seven months, and 21 days of peace, a new tempest was brewing. One that would pit man against man, friend against friend, and have the power to split a continent. And on the 3rd September, New Zealand declared war on Germany, beginning 2,176 days of hard-fought battles that would further define our nation. This declaration of war was a clear indication of how far we as a country had come since our past battles. The government of Peter Fraser, seeking to extend this growth, the establishment of our own independent war council, the conscription of New Zealand citizens, his vision was to look past the nurturing arms of Great Britain and venture, much like the soldiers, into the wider world. Eventually establishing a legation in 1942 at Washington, D.C., creating a connection that was still prove vital till this day, he secured our independent voice and our global family. Aotearoa was a country growing politically, economically and socially, and we mirrored this through the commitment of 104,000 brave men and women who were dedicated to the restoration of international peace. 
They were deployed in terrains vastly removed from the rolling hills of pasture many would have been accustomed to. Ultimately, being deployed in the sharp hills of Italy, the island nation of Crete, the bog-downed Western Front, and the brutal desert of Northern Africa. But not only were we slogging away on the battlefield, but also on the pastures they have left behind. Our rural heritage becoming key to the support of our troops, solidifying our identity and our countryside. Yet, we weren't just defined by one ideal, one trait, one gender, or one race, but by the stoic women of New Zealand, by the brave Māori battalion, who had proved the world over that they too could endure the trenches, both becoming an integral part of our war effort at home, in Monte Cassino, in Northern Africa, at the Western Front, they proved themselves. We would show how the New Zealand identity could still be forged in our darkest of days, the storm of war not dampening our souls. Instead, it had strengthened our nation. Heroic platoons like the 2nd New Zealand EF would further define this in the searing sands of northern Africa. Their ingenious offensive in Minkakaim, utilising the cover of night, the silence of their bayonets, to break through the encirclement of German troops so that they could fight for our nation one more day. And after years of fighting, New Zealand's longest operation in World War II would come to an end on the 13th of May, 1945, their guns fell silent, earning them a three-month forlorn home, not returning as soldiers, returning as New Zealanders. We would continue to mold the Kiwi character in both Vietnam and Korea, where we were amongst political equals, where we were in the position in which we could extend our arms of support to our fellow man showing the world that we care about the rights of our fellow man above all. Until this day, we continue that ethos in our peacekeeping missions in Afghanistan and other countries where the fight for democracy still wages on, proving that in our modern age, we are still a brave, tenacious, and honorable people who will give their all for our homeland. We are Kiwis, and we are proud to be. Brave New Zealand men and women who have and will continue to fight for our nation deserve our respect, for they are the ones who have secured the lives we lead today. They deserve to be celebrated, for they are the ones who have pioneered the Kiwi identity. They deserve our commemoration. We as a nation have waded into the flood of war. We have withstood the wind, the sleet, the snow, and the sand. We have endured the blistering sun on our backs and found through all of this what the Kiwi identity truly is.